Well, hello, my friends. Welcome to me, your host, Christian Watson. So for those of you who've been watching my channel for long enough, you'll probably notice that I sometimes mention Star Wars quite a bit. Quite a bit, not just because I think Star Wars is just a phenomenal example of cinematography or that the story and the lore behind the Star Wars universe is absolutely brilliant and also can give us some very tangible and invaluable lessons for our everyday lives, but also because I have been immersed into Star Wars ever since I can ever since I could remember. I remember going into Playground Elementary School and doing lightsaber fights uh, with my friends um, after having seen. Uh, the dreaded um, prequels. If you're a Star Wars fan, you'll know what I'm talking about. The so-called dreaded prequels. Um, even though I think the prequels are absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with them at all. Um, it, but it, it was, it's, it's been a labor of love, of learning about Star Wars, watching Star Wars, and just doing things as it relates to understanding Star Wars on a higher level. And one of my all-time favorite characters in Star Wars is Master Yoda. And I will call him Master Yoda throughout this video as a sign of respect. Even though he's a fictional character, the principles and concepts that he conveys through his character are just so phenomenal to us. And as I was thinking about them, I thought, Christian, so much of what Yoda says can and should be applied to how you approach politics on this channel. Because a lot of people may see the title of this video and think, how in the world can a fictional character have anything to do with real life politics? But my friends, just like any other storyline or universe or canon, Star Wars, as I mentioned before, has certain philosophical principles embodied within it, which are very practical and actionable in everyday life. And some of those principles are principles that Yoda talked about. And actually, a lot of the principles that Yoda talked about can be very appealing and can actually be very, uh, can resonate a lot with you if you're in the same right-leaning American conservative libertarian tradition that I am. What do I mean? Well, there are three primary principles that Yoda talks about that I think are just fundamental to my own personal political philosophy, which I'll explain in a second, and which I think if you really want to get the truth and understand some of the more uh, basic things about individualism and about good governance, they should be endemic to yours as well. And there, these three principles are the following. Yoda focuses in, on objective reality. Uh, he acknowledges that objective reality exists, and he uses that to inform how he instructs people on the Force. I'll get to that in a second. Um, number two, Yoda also focuses on human beings not simply being made of matter, flesh, and bones, but being something greater, bigger than that, and then tapping into that grit, that vast well of potential and greatness to do things through our flesh and bones. And then number three, Yoda talks about the importance of containing the passions, subduing the passions in everyday life. And all of these are quite relevant to what I'm about to tell you. So, my friends, before I can tell you how Yoda relates to my political philosophy, I must explain my philosophy to you. My political philosophy is signed on a few, a few core assumptions. Number one, the reality that we live in can be understood, it can be known, it can be understood and known through observation, filtered through reason. Reason is a tool that we use to, uh, to interpret the information around us, but without observation, reason is useless. There are some people who believe in the idea of innate knowledge that we are born with certain kinds of knowledge in our head already. I don't believe in that. Reason needs data. Reason needs things, objects to be applied to, or else what are you reasoning about? You're reasoning about You could be reasoning about things you make up in your mind, fantasies, and we'll get to that in a second because Joe talks about that a little bit. So I believe that, that reality is observable, it's knowable through observation, filtered through reason. And I believe the knowability of reality also includes certain kinds of principles and laws that bind us, bind our existence to them, like the law of gravitation, law of gravity. Gravity is literally all around us. It binds us. It, it like quite literally allows life to happen as it happens right now. If gravity were to suspend, existence would be virtually, at least on Earth, would be virtually impossible. Things wouldn't be as they are. And there are also other kinds of laws, uh, ecological laws of the planet, all kind of objective things that we can see happening in nature that have been happening for a very, very long time, for as long as we could observe them. But I also believe there's a moral dimension to these laws of the universe and law of reality. And that moral dimension is called natural law. And all natural law is, it's a, it's a lower reflection of the laws of the universe. I say lower because natural law 
it encompasses laws of the universe, but for our political purposes, I, I like to say, it, I think about it like, like, like this. Natural law is on the earth. The universe is beyond the earth. It encompasses everything, whereas natural law is on the earth. Now, natural law would apply other places as well, but still, I like to think of it that way. It's more concept easy to conceptualize that. And what natural law says, it says that there are certain principles that we can look at that exist in nature, that, that are, are observable through the natural world, which can help us on how we can live morally responsible and flourishing lives. The end of natural law is to ensure that every human being is able to do what they must, to, to abide by moral principles, to adhere to a correct sense of duty, to exercise their reason, to ensure that civilization stays intact as well. Now, of course, civilization, that staying intact is not the, it's not the primary aim of natural law, but it's one of the consequences of natural law. So um, philosopher Hugo Grotius says in 1622 in Rights of War and Peace that human beings come into society, come into civilization, inherently wanting peaceable existence. And this peaceable existence is a part of the uh, foundation of natural law because Grotius says that human beings are social animals and us being social means that Typically, this is the general principle. Obviously, people default against this. Typically, we don't want to do things that will break down our ability to be social with other people, i.e., we don't want to do things that will destroy civilization or cooperation. There are some folks who do, but generally, that's, that, that's an aberration of human action as opposed to an example of it. And so I believe that these principles that we deduce from nature, which are derivatives from, them, from the law of the universe— and can be observed in nature and observed in reality and filtered through reason so we can understand their contents, lead us to certain political and ethical conclusions. And part of that is that every human being has rights. Rights being the moral qualities that people possess um, that put in positions on other people on how to act. So for example, as a human being, I am self-controlling. I am self-governing. I have the ability to regulate my actions and therefore regulate my, 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 my life as far as it extends to me. Now, there are other people that can come into contact with my life who may want to try to regulate my life for me. But according to natural law, since I am a self-controlling individual, I have a right to life. And from that right to life also flows a right to ownership. I own myself. If I control myself, I also own myself. And from that flows the idea of property rights, okay? I own myself. And therefore, as Locke said in uh, Second Treaties of Government, if I mix my labor with the earth, if I use my self-controlling will, which again, I also own, to create something, I therefore own that. It goes from just me owning myself to me owning the labors, the fruits of my labor, the sort of spiritual transaction between the sort of more abstract me owning myself to the physical me concretizing what I own. Okay, and then I also have the right to liberty. And all liberty is, liberty encompasses my right to life and my right to property because liberty is what allows those two things to exist in the first place. Because liberty itself is simply the capacity to act, to act in accordance to one's will, to act in accordance to one's will, and I'll add one's conscience as well. And the idea of the natural law is that human beings have a certain moral conscience, a certain moral sense within themselves that intuitively tell us what is right and what is wrong. Even if we don't solely get to that through intuition, it tells us what is right and what is wrong, right? The idea, one of these ideas we can see in modern society is that a baby, uh, a baby uh, may not know anything else, but babies know tastes and they also know no. They know the word no. And so sometimes when, the, when a parent's trying to feed a baby something, they'll like recite back and say, no, this is a sort of primitive version of the the ability to act, the ability of liberty. And obviously this becomes more this becomes more and more developed over time. And so what Grotius says in the second chapter of On the Rights of War and Peace, he says that there are two primary principles that human beings live by. So you have the knowledge of things that conform to reason, and then the first impressions of nature. So the first impressions of nature is basically the instincts that every natural being, human or otherwise, have. That means the, 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 the desire for self-preservation. All of us want to preserve, preserve ourselves. We have self-interest that flows from that, you know, things of that sort, and to do things that perpetuate ourselves in our form. 
But when you take those things and then you apply them to reason, you can go to a more advanced level. So yes, we want to preserve ourselves, but we can preserve ourselves in a way that's not simply eating food and, and sleeping, but is eating food, sleeping, that is getting into relationships, building civilizations, sharing on all the things. But there are animals that can't do that because animals are stuck on a certain level of reasoning. Oh, I guess it's good stuff, guys. They're stuck on a certain level of, 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 of understanding, rather, not reasoning because they can't reason, that limits them from being able to conform their knowledge to reason. Animals' knowledges are bound entirely by their instinct. Okay. And so all of these principles, the universal law coming the natural law, me being self-owning, me being uh, self-controlling, put impositions on the government. The government therefore exists to preserve my ability to do these things, not to give me anything, uh, not to uh, force me to do anything, uh, to, uh, whether it be my, take my resources, whether it be um, I'm trying to deprive me of life or limb without just cause. The government has impositions on it, and so does society. And that basically forms the crux of my political philosophy. There are governments are meant to preserve. They are not meant to take. Um, rights are things that are certainties and reality. They are not just political conveniences. Rights are pre-political and they come into the political. And it is the goal of the political to preserve them and to make sure that if anyone else tries to take them from me, they're stopped. And to also ensure that the mediations that I have between other people are also set up in a way that is not uh, that is that is not arbitrary and involves an independent person. This is the basic philosophy of minarchism as well. Okay. So how does Master Yoda fit into all of this? And obviously, this is a gross oversimplification of my philosophy, but it's the basic points, and if you understand these, you basically get what I'm coming from. Well, Master Yoda, my philosophy rests on the idea of objective reality, and so does Master Yoda's. So for example, Master Yoda, when he is talking to Luke, and this is one of the greatest scenes in all of Star Wars, when he is talking to Luke, uh, when Luke's on Dagobah in, in the swamp, and Luke is trying to uh, get his X-Wing out of the swamp. Uh, he's trying to teach Luke about what the Force is and what he's capable of if he truly leans into the Force. And here is what he says to Luke about the Force here. For my ally is the Force, and a powerful ally it is. Life creates it, makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. You must feel the force around you. Here, between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere. Yes, even between the land and the ship. Okay, it binds us. It's in life all around us. It guides us. The force is not simply this tool that we can use, although it is a tool we can use. It's also this all-encompassing order, fundamental order to life, to everything that concerns life. That's what natural all law is, my friends. Natural law is this fundamental order to that which controls uh, concerns life. It exists in all, of, in all of us. It binds us together in civilization. It allows us to make, to understand the world as it is and to, then to see how we can use that to, to push forward good things, to push forward good actions, to live a richer, better life, to use, as Cicero would say, right reason to do certain things. So the force operates just like natural law, except the force is more so of a, um, whereas natural law is something that you can more so observe and you can appreciate independent of any advanced training. The force obviously in Star Wars is something you can appreciate, observe, it, it's, it exists around you. But if you want to really get into it, you have to be force sensitive and you have to really um, train yourself. Whereas you don't have to train yourself to appreciate natural law. So in a sense, my philosophy is simpler than the others, but we both emerge from the same genus, right? It's the same general idea, just different methods of getting there in different methods of application. But also, it is, this, this explains another thing that's very good as well about Yoda's philosophy. So the force is a universal idea. It's not bound to circumstances. As Yoda said, it, life, it encompasses life. So it's a universal idea. So Yoda uses the universal idea of the force to speak to Luke's temporary local situation. And his local situation at that moment was that his, ex, his, that his ship, X Wing, I forgot what it was, is emerged in the swamp and he can't get it out. Now, obviously, Yoda was trying to convey to Luke a bigger lesson that this is not just about your ship, this is about your, your capacity, your ability to change the world. 
but it was the universal. It was the universal idea of the force which produced this circumstance in the first place insofar as that universal idea informs how Yoda approaches it and informs how Luke should approach it and that being the correct way to approach things. So natural law being a universal idea it creates certain situations or creates the foundations for certain situations and then informs us about how we're supposed to approach those things on those foundations and it is therefore our choice to keep it or leave it. If you take out a loan and you will become a and you become a, a a debtor, you become a debtor. You're supposed to pay your lender back. That's the natural law. How you do it is going to be up to you and your lender. But the general principle is that if you if you enter into a contractual agreement, you're supposed to pay that back because doing otherwise would disrespect that person and therefore violate the sense of duty that you have, duty and obligation to pay that back. And there are all kind of other applications to this on both the micro level and the macro level. But the point is this: just like Yoda used the universality of the force to inform the local situation. We can use the universality of natural law to look at very particular ethical situations and then make determinations that will allow us to live within the light of truth. My friends, Yoda's method is just like my method. And it's brilliant. Not because it's my method, because it's the truth. But also, my friends, Yoda mentioned something that is, that's one of my favorite quotes from all time. While he's trying to teach Luke how to apply the universe to the local, he says this. Luminous beings, though. Not this crude matter. Luminous beings are we, not this cruel matter. My friends, there are so many philosophical schools, there are so many even political lines of thought that try to reduce human beings to statistical averages, to uh, to, to to mere uh, uh, to mere conglomerates of atoms, the idea that we're simply just atoms in a fixed space, that's all we are as human beings, we're just atoms, we're just serotonin, we're just our brain chemistry, love is just chemicals basically, all this kind of stuff, trying to reduce the complexities of life to bare bones, fat, like uh, scientific terms. This is an idea called scientism. And I think you've seen a lot of this idea on display during the COVID-19 pandemic, where the conversation was much more about, okay, how do we save life? And we'll get to that in a second. How do we save life, right? Uh, and, and even though we didn't even have all the tools at our disposal, uh, the local wasn't necessarily informed about all the tools at our disposal. Because of that, we completely ignored the universal, completely focused on the local, and decided to do things in the local that violated the universal, as in experts around the, around the world suggested locking people up in their houses or keeping them in their houses for a long while, installing curfews, vaccine mandates, things that we are now seeing did not, according to John Hopkins' study, did not do anything really to beat back the coronavirus in a substantial way, and also things that, uh, in a sense, misaligned priorities because we understood that the people who are uh, men who are obese or who are mentally uh, um, or, or who are physically unwell rather they were the most effective category and the, the old as well of coronavirus but we didn't take that into consideration because again the local was guiding our considerations we weren't looking to the idea of knowledge to reason we reduced everything to a set of numbers we reduced everything to the crude the the, the, the crude uh, not facts, but 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 a, a sort of crude perspective about who we are as human beings. We forgot that we are luminous beings. When Yoda says luminous beings, what he's really saying is that there's something about us that transcends our bodies, that transcends our flesh. And this is true. My friends, just like there are other animals around that wander this earth who have no conception of reason, human beings being evolved from that same family of, of animals are have a high, or have a higher disposition in the natural world because we do have a conception of reason. We do have an ability to understand certain things and to, and to reason at a higher level. We do have the ability to take the crude matter of the earth and create it to, to, to do something uh, great like go to the moon or to um, create create machines that zip us around the earth in matters of hours as opposed to days, weeks, or months as our ancestors had to go through. We have used our faculties to perfect ourselves, to perfect our world, and to make it easier for us to exist in this world. We have done that. We've not always done it in the best way. And there are many people who have used the faculties for evil as well. But the point is this, the fact that human beings are the only creatures on this earth that have the ability to reason and who have the ability to reason at a higher level 
shows us that we are more than just the matter. We are not simply prisoners of instinct as our animals, brothers and sisters are, as, our, as cats are, as dogs are, as giraffes are. We are things that are higher. We are creatures that are much higher than that. That's luminosity. Because when you're a luminous being, you glow. You glow. And what happens when you glow? You can see more. At, with the faculty of reason, we can see more than an animal can with instinct. We can see more. We can see the world in color. We can see the world in much more different shades than a cat can or a bird can or a crow can. We're not simply on this earth to survive. Survive, we can be on the earth to thrive as well. That's our luminosity. Then if you take that idea and you transpose it with a transcendentalist idea that every human being has a divine genius, which is confirmed, by the way, biomedical individuality. All of us have a, 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 unique, foot, uh, a unique fingerprint, unique brain chemistry. Everything about ourselves is unique to us. Even if we use the same tools as other people, there's no guarantee you'll apply those tools in the same way. So if you use the, the bare facts of your existence, the bare facts of your physiology to enforce this fact that it also seems that we are even more luminous because all of us have our own skill sets, all of us have our own gifts and abilities that we can therefore use to make our lives better, to enrich the world with our, with, with our touch and things of that sort. That's the luminosity that Yoda is talking about and that is absolutely core to my idea of individualism. The idea that every individual matters and every individual should be considered and individuals themselves should be prided over the collective and therefore you have to respect rights, but you also have to respect conscience as well, my friends, because if you don't respect conscience, you are quite literally disrespecting and trying to destroy the moral sense, disrespecting and trying to destroy the foundations for our actions that can be good. That's luminosity. You must see that luminosity. But the problem is throughout history, you've had dictators, you've had tyrants who have been blinded by that luminosity because they didn't want to see it. They, they wanted to interpret your life, your life into a certain way. And what did they do? They put people in camps. They, they enslave people. They kill people. They uh, would have stolen into the kulaks. He took their land because he had a certain idea about how land ownership was supposed to happen and how economic development was supposed to happen. Even though those ideas were completely anterior to the truth, he thought those ideas were the best. And so he used force. He used force to overcome other people, and yet his project still failed eventually. Because <sighs> the truth is resolute. Luminosity burns out every square inch of darkness. But if we're luminous and we're, we have the ability to operate higher than the instincts, then it also makes sense, my friends, that the, our, our passions, which again are part of the first impressions of nature, I've talked about this category before, our passions, walk with me here, are a constant threat to our ability to be luminous because animals have passions. Animals are guided by emotions. They're guided by instinct. They can get mad, they can be jovial, but passions can threaten our ability to think reasonably because emotions have that effect. Because emotions are a sensation that we feel that can, that can overcome reason. So whereas, whereas, whereas reason is active, emotions can be passive. You can see something that makes you disgusted and you can become disgusted even without knowing why you're disgusted. You know, human beings have these sort of sensory, sort of sensory things about us. Whereas reason requires active consideration. It requires sitting down and thinking. And guess what? That's difficult. It's been difficult for anyone of any age. It's difficult. But feeling something is not difficult at all. Because you, you, know, you don't have to justify why you feel something. You can just feel it. But you have to justify the conclusions of your reason. You guys aren't hearing me right now. You have to justify that for it to make any sense. For it to fit into the category of reason. But those passions? Oh, no. Which is why the natural law theorist said that when you have an individual who, who checks their passions with reason, who subdues, who is not carried away by blind passion, by, as Grosch just said, that is an individual who can understand the world, who can reason with people, who can live a good life, things of that sort, who is within the bounds of natural law. But if you are carried away by passions, that you can't even live well or live at all because you're, you're, you, 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 the, the, the engine that controls your life is sputtering out. It's sputtering out and exploding. And Yoda made a very similar point. When Anakin Skywalker um, came in front of the Jedi Council when he was a little boy, in the Phantom Menace, Yoda made this point. 
Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. My gosh. Fear is the path to the dark side. It leads to hate and suffering and anger. My friends, fear is one of the strongest of our passions. Because again, every single living thing has, or at least most living things have the ability to fear, some level of it, even if it's on a very crude, primitive level. But human beings have it just as anything else has it. And guess what? Fear can drive people to do some very crazy thing. Why do you, th even contemporarily we can see this, why do you think people were buying up gas um, when the pipeline busted not too long ago? Why do you think people were buying up toilet paper at the beginning of the pandemic? Why do you think uh, there are a bunch of people who are preppers? I'm not knocking preppers, by the way. It's always good to have your own have your own stuff. It's always good to have your own food. That's good in any situation. But there are people who prep in the context of very absurd events like a meteor hitting Earth or something like that. Why do you think there are people that go out and hunt Bigfoot and who are, and who are scared of, of Megalodon still? Because their passion, their imagination excites their passions and their passions guide them but if they were to apply a little bit of reason well maybe the meteorite won't strike earth according to our data well maybe bigfoot doesn't exist or maybe megalodon has gone extinct if they were to uh, contain their imagination for just a second with their ability to reason as human beings can perhaps they wouldn't be carried away but fear leads to other things fear can lead to hate i mean there's a reason why there are certain people who hate what they don't understand Fear can lead to all kinds of things which deteriorate our ability to use our faculties the way they're meant to be used and thus makes our lives inferior and mediocre to their intended purpose. Our intended purpose as human beings is to think, interact, create. Think, interact, create. Of course, there's more than that, but that's part of our core functions. And ergo, it'd be best if we use them since it's part of our core functions. And Yoda understood that. Yoda understood that if you don't contain your passions, temper it with reason, it can really cause harm to you and your ability to live. My friends, it is my, my opinion that every single person should listen to Master Yoda, not simply as a, as, a, as a little green character on a screen in a far, far away universe, but as a, a, a compelling teacher who has the ability to instruct us on some very basic and noble principles that when you actually consider them substantively, using your faculties as I've mentioned before, they aren't so endemic of a far, far away universe. They are actually quite native to the reality that we live in right now. And they can help us achieve the kind of government that it would be the best, achieve the kind of society that would be the best, and also achieve the kind of a life that would be 